Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz on the show tonight. When you think about it, these are all personal debts. The Illinois Supreme Court weighs whether politicians can use campaign supporters' money to wage a legal defense. I didn't overpromise, and what I have probably uh, outperformed what anybody thought would happen. President Joe Biden reflects on his first year in office as his poll numbers sink. Our Spotlight Politics examines the Biden presidency. Yeah, but everyone is saying, whoa, slow down. Airlines cancel some flights as 5G service launches a partial rollout. We have local reaction. A look at the stress parents are under amid the ongoing pandemic and how they could be their own special interest group. I didn't know it, but I started going into a deep state of depression. A beloved local musician hit bottom. We find out how he made it back. And I realized I could change the world. And a taste of some restaurants featured on a new season of To Dine For with Kate Sullivan. But first, some of today's top stories. Chicago's top doctor says the city has passed an important milestone in the COVID-19 surge driven by the Omicron variant. I am very, very pleased to say that we have formally passed the Omicron peak here in the city of Chicago. However, we are a long way from being out of the woods and it's really important over these next few weeks and months that we continue to work hard on getting folks vaccinated, getting folks tested, continuing to wear masks because there's a long way to come down. Chicago's COVID test positivity peaked at 19.6% on January 1st and dropped to 12.6% on Tuesday, the lowest rate since December 28th, according to city data. Arbody adds hospitalizations have not yet begun to drop, but they have plateaued. President Joe Biden holds a rare formal press conference to mark his first year in office. With sagging approval ratings, Biden acknowledged the level of exhaustion among the American people two years into the COVID pandemic. I know there's a lot of frustration and fatigue in this country, and we know why. COVID-19, I'm not going to give up and accept things as they are now. Some people may call what's happening now the new normal. I call it a job not yet finished. It will get better. But Biden also admitted that he would have to break up his Build Back Better bill and climate spending plan into big chunks to at least pass part of his sweeping agenda. Meanwhile, Senate Democrats press ahead to, with efforts to pass voting rights legislation despite Republican opposition. Senators have been debating the measure all afternoon and are expected to vote on the legislation this evening. Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth cited the sacrifices of civil rights activists and soldiers in fighting for and maintaining democracy as she called out opponents of the bill. I'm not asking anyone to do anything nearly as difficult as putting on a uniform and going to war or crossing a bridge to be met with billy clubs. All I'm asking for is the bare minimum. All I'm begging them to do is merely to not sit in silence in the face of grave injustice. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says if Republicans block the bill, he'll hold a vote to change Senate rules. Up next, the Illinois Supreme Court tackles what you can and can't do with campaign funds. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Can public officials legally pay for their criminal defense with campaign money? That's a question of interest to several current and former Illinois office holders and one before the state's high court right now. Amanda Vinicky joins us with more. Amanda. Yes, Paris, there's a reason that Chicago and Illinois have developed notorious reputations for corruption, and that is because, as you've noted, more frequent than not, we've got a lot of officials who are accused of bribery, attempted extortion, and other forms of corruption. And when they do, they're frequently not paying their legal bills out of their own pockets. Instead, they use their campaign cash. 
contributions given to them by supporters over the years to pay their attorneys. Now, the question before the state's high court, is that legal? The question is getting raised by Chicago's 25th Ward Alder person, Byron Sigcho Lopez, who took legal action against his predecessor in that office, disgraced former alderman Danny Solis. Solis had relied on his campaign fund to pay legal bills over $200,000, by the way, in connection with a bribe that eventually snared alderman Ed Burke. Now, Burke has since spent about $2 million of campaign money on his legal defense. Burke's wife, Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke, has recused herself from the case now before her, the state's high court. These are all complicated uh, connections to be sure, but Sigcho Lopez's attorney says that the matter at hand before justice is really one of common sense. He says that campaign finance laws are meant to prevent and to root out corruption, and it would be antithetical for a law intended for that cause can then be relied upon by corrupt politicians for their defense. The purpose behind those are to combat and deter public corruption. So what a slap in the face if you have a law that is meant to deter public corruption through campaign limits and uh, uh, transparency and limiting use of money uh, for campaign related matters. But then you niche out the ability for one of these politicians facing public corruption, the very evil this is supposed to <laughs> come back, and you allow them to use this money. Candidates and officials can use supporters' donations, he says, for legal expenses for things like making sure they're in compliance with campaign finance law or for ballot changes. But he argues that Solis's use in this case wasn't business. Rather, it was personal, and he says that should not be tolerated. But Michael Dorf, who's representing Solis's 25th War Organization, says Solis wouldn't have been in these circumstances were it not for the public position he held. And Dorf says that Sigcho Lopez is acting as if all politicians accused of corruption are guilty, but he says even those that aren't can also incur oppressive legal bills. People who are public officials who have no uh, connection with a person who may be under investigation may have had an email from that person. And suddenly, they are the subject of, of a subpoena for, for thousands of records. Director of Reform for Illinois, Elisa Kaplan, says it can be stomach-churning for people when they think about officials and candidates they entrusted with money and donated to for their campaigns or to run their offices to then use it to defend corruption charges. But she says, again, echoing Dorf, that these are often circumstances that these individuals would not be in were it not for the positions that they hold. And she also says if the campaign doesn't pay for these legal expenses, who does? She says that could put candidates and members of their staff who are not personally wealthy at a disadvantage. It's understandable why people would recoil at that idea. But think about the fact that, for example, not everybody who's accused of corruption is guilty uh, and they have the right to a defense and they would not have had these accusations leveled at them if they were not uh, a candidate or a public official. And so it really is a legitimate, you could see it as a legitimate campaign expense. She says that it is a complicated question and adds that you also at least have transparency if this is listed as a campaign donation versus potentially having uh, candidates go out and ask, for example, for a GoFundMe to help to deal with any sort of legal battles that they might face. Now, you did have several justices during today's oral arguments interject, including Justice Michael Burke. He is no relation to either the alderman or or to the Supreme Court Chief Justice. He, Burke, in this case, pointed to an opinion from the New York Supreme Court that ruled that politicians cannot use their campaign funds to defend themselves on corruption charges. We have yet to reach the point when it can be said that defending against federal or state criminal indictment alleging corrupt practices is an ordinary expense of holding public office. Are we at that point in Illinois where we're going to say that that's an ordinary expense of holding public office? He did not pose that question rhetorically, but it is perhaps a, a good way to wrap up this discussion for now, Paris. 
couple of ads though, Justice Burke is one of the individuals who will be up for election himself this year. Meanwhile, you have two measures. One was introduced by a Democratic member of the Illinois House, the other by a Republican, both put forth in 2021 to explicitly forbid campaign money from being used for criminal defense. But both of those measures were held up in the General Assembly, not advancing at all. So with that, back to you. Amanda, as you know, the fourth quarter campaign reports come out uh, in recent days. And you look at some of those reports, and in the expenditures, you see law firms uh, in, in many of those reports. So obviously a, a case of being closely watched here in Illinois. Thanks very, very much. Very relevant discussion, certainly. Absolutely. Major international airlines have canceled and modified hundreds of flights due to concern over the rollout of 5G service. The Federal Aviation Administration has warned that the much-hyped high-speed wireless service could interfere with aircraft technology. AT&T and Verizon announced they've delayed launching 5G near some airports after airlines and President Biden intervened. And joining us to discuss the cause for concern and more are Randy Berry, a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Northwestern University, and Joseph Sweeterman, transportation specialist and professor at DePaul University. Uh, welcome to both of you. Randy Berry, first off, remind us what 5G or fifth generation wireless technology is. So this is the next um, iteration of the, the technology underlying your cell phone. So currently most of us have 4G or LTE cell phones. Um, 5G is, is the next version of that. It's offering higher data rates um, and some other enhanced features. And of course, it's because it's using a certain spectrum of radio frequency. And Joe, in, in short, why are airlines so concerned about cell phone companies using this so-called C-band spectrum? We can see our tolerance for, for risk of air travel has fallen where risks just are not seen as acceptable. And here we had some unknowns for the airline. And it reminds me of the debate over cell phone calls uh, at high altitude, which our country decided not to do because of just some lingering uncertainty. Here we had a massive rollout of a 5G program you know, by two big providers, uh, Verizon AT&T, and the airlines had not been given uh, a credible evidence that there wasn't going to be interference uh, and low visibility landing. So you multiply that by the the number of flights we have per day and the risk was just seen as unacceptable. So the concern here is the altimeter, uh, which which obviously pilots rely on to land in low visibility. And uh, Randy Berry, how much evidence is there that cellular use in this spectrum, in this RF spectrum, will impact those altimeters? There's, there's, I would say there's not, I haven't seen a lot of hard evidence. I think there's a lot of, um, discussion about what might be possible. Um, you know, these bands are separated. There's about a, a 200 megahertz guard band between the C band and what the altimeters use. And, and a big question is, you know, is, is that enough? Um, I think the FCC and the wireless providers tend to think it is. Um, the airlines obviously do not, right? <laughs> And Joe Sweeterman, today uh, they put a pause, they all agreed to a pause in the 5G rollout around certain airports. Which airports are we talking about? What are the parameters of this pause now? Well, this was a remarkable thing because we had a, almost a game of chicken in the media where both sides were rele uh, elevating the rhetoric about mass chaos in the air and so forth. And, and the compromise being we're going to not deploy it at certain airports and it's hopeful that we could avoid the chaos today. And international airlines just felt that the cutbacks didn't give them enough assurance. So uh, really airlines flying the 777, which is a big plane uh, retfitted usually to about 550 seats, uh, scrambled to find a different kind of airplane when they felt that the risks were less and boy, lots of cancellations because of just the ambiguity uh, in the air right now. All right, well, let's hear concerns from the head of the Allied Pilots Union, uh, Dennis Tager, who will pilot obviously himself. He weighed in with us earlier today. I may go to an airport like Chicago LaGuardia is going to likely be um, protected airports. But if I have to divert somewhere for an equipment issue or weather's not good uh, at either place, I'm going to go to a 5G airport. I've got a lot to look at and a lot of distractions that we really feel are unnecessary. They're trying to just roll this out again in a metered way, which is better than fulsome like they were talking about and say, hey, Captain, let us know if there are any issues. That's not how we do business in the U.S. aviation world. 
Randall Berry, what needs to be resolved during this pause to make folks like uh, Captain Tejer feel comfortable? So coming back, I think the real the question is, you know, is this does the interference leak over um, in a significant amount um, around these airports where 5G is deployed that it would cause these altimeters not to work correctly? Um, and I think there need that there needs to be more testing. There needs to be more studies of that to make people feel confident. And Joe Sweeterman, it's not a new thing because Verizon, AT and T, they spent something like what eighty billion dollars for the right to use this frequency to launch 5G. So why are these concerns coming to a head now when it's rolling out? <laughs> the res mark about twenty one co companies, a you know eighty one billion dollars spent. They want to see the return on their investment. And the FAA did allow uh, a push for deployment to be delayed a couple of weeks, but that just brought us to now where we're back to where we were. And uh, I think we're seeing that some, so the ball dropped really with the federal government not to space this out, to have credible testing. And I think what, what's really uh, sad about this is just the number of passengers that were disrupted uh, during this. I mean, some upwards of 32,000 passengers on Amer uh, Emirates alone have been affected by this. So. Uh, why this brinkmanship didn't happen a month ago with the phase rollout uh, really is on the minds of a lot of people that uh, uh, this didn't do any, any service to our uh, national, world aviation system. Right, because as you mentioned, the international flights, especially flying the 777, are the ones canceling flights and worried about uh, what this means for them. Randall Berry, tell us more about 5G. I mean, the proponents in the telecom industry say it, it's going to spur more self-driving cars. It's going uh, to revolutionize health care. How does that connect to, to all these big advances? So to, to support those big advances, you, you need more data rate. You need to be able to support higher data rates. And you know, for that, you need more spectrum. And that's what, what led to you know, the C band being one of the bands. So it's one of many bands that 5G uses. It's not the only one. Um, but you know, that's a key ingredient to, to realize those promises that you're talking about. Joe Sweeterman, if you had to guess, will there be a resolution here that makes everybody happy? I mean, one of the things I've read about is well, they all want to wait for these older altimeters to retire, and, and newer altimeters uh, won't face the same kind of problem of interference. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, what we see here is there's a lot of pathways to keep the AV system running while still benefiting 5G. I mean, for one, most of the problem are towers within two miles of an airport. I mean, that's a pretty small window. I also think the FAA is fast certifying certain planes. Uh, that aren't uh, at risk. Why that didn't happen a few weeks ago, I don't know, but they're doing it today. So airlines feel comfortable with uh, certain equipment and even the 777 might be okay. So I think we'll see a frenzied effort uh, with some compromise, uh, but it is a shame it got to this level with, uh, from what I can tell, at least four or five big international planes uh, canceled into Chicago today. So there's, there's some pain being felt. All right. So a lot of catching up to do in the uh, air travel industry. And we'll watch how this resolves. Our thanks to Randy Berry and Joe Sweeterman. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Adam Brandis with a look at a group of Americans feeling the pressures of the pandemic. Parents. Brandis. Paris, thank you. Addressing reporters this afternoon, President Biden acknowledged he may have to break up parts of his signature Build Back Better bill in order to get it through Congress. Now, some of the social components of that bill would have the biggest impact on parents. Universal pre-kindergarten, child care subsidies, and a one-year child tax credit extension. Our next guest says parents have the power to become the country's strongest special interest group. Joining us now to talk about parenting amid the pandemic is Dr. Dana Suskind, author and director and founder of 30 Million Words. That's an initiative aimed at narrowing the language gap between kids from lower income families and those in wealthier households. Suskind is also a pediatric physician at the University of Chicago. Welcome back to Chicago tonight. Dr. Suskind, first tell us, you know, what has been the impact of parents uh, on this protracted, you know, well, of this protracted, you know, pandemic experience? Look, I think that this pandemic has left, not only left families reeling, um, left completely on their own, but it's really highlighted the, the, the lack of infrastructure and support for families uh, from all backgrounds with children from all ages. And it has really left them struggling and reeling, and as a result, their children as well. 
How would you say the pandemic or pandemic parenting has um, been different for parents of smaller kids versus those of older five and up kids? Look, it's hard for everyone, but by far and away, those first three to five years of life are the most intensive. And in this country, it is the time period that we really leave parents almost completely on their own. And while they were struggling before, the, um, the pandemic has really made it that much more difficult um, without the lack of uh, paid family leave, without, the le without high quality childcare, uh, families are left to be everything from teachers, coaches, camp counselors, uh, while trying to juggle uh, working as well. So it has been very difficult for all families, but especially families of, of young children. You wrote in an op-ed in The Hill last week that the largest social safety net expansion in 80 years, which would be this part of the Build Back Better Act, has been repeatedly dangled in front of parents. What could that measure do for parents? It could be a game changer. Um, let's just put uh, things in perspective. Uh, in this country, uh, Parents are primary are basically left on their own. Unlike almost any other OECD country, we, we have no paid uh, family leave. We have no high quality child care. And this, in a sense, would reverse that and start uh, supporting families in their most important roles, especially in the early years. Um, you know, supporting their children's developing brains. So this this bill in whatever form with the paid parental leave, the high quality child care, the child tax credit would finally give families the support that they need to be able to parent the way in which they want to parent. You, uh, you wrote about how uh, the federal government addressed this problem uh, during World War II. Briefly tell us what was done then. Yeah, it, it's amazing what our country will do when there is a necessity. Uh, when men went off to war, um, it left women there. Um, and because they knew that the children needed to be cared for, they actually created a system of high quality child care, really high quality child care, which filled the gap and amazingly allowed the women to go to work and fill where the men had left and has had long-term positive impacts on those children that were in, in those high quality child care. Um, systems. But of course, when the men came back, despite everybody loving, loving these child care centers through the Langham Act, um, it was ended. And since that time, and uh, we have been left with a hodgepodge of uh, stop gaps that we call a child care system, which really isn't. So right. uh, you also write about AARP and sort of likening what parents could do to what AARP does um, for older Americans. What would that look like for parents? Yeah, no. To know the story of the AARP is to know the story of a group of individuals coming together to really push forward social change. So back in the 60s, um, the elderly were the poorest segment of society. 50% lived in almost abject poverty. And um, they came together through, uh, it, it was called something before the AARP, but um, they came together and together they became the strongest uh, political voice that we have today. And just by creating the AARP, they decreased elderly poverty by 70%. They have advocated for you know, many different things that have really elevated um, the security, uh, the safety net for elderly. Um, but what does it look like today for parents and their children? Well, today, children are actually the poor segment of society. And as a result, uh, the parents who are taking care of them. But yet we have 60 million parents who all want the same thing for their children. They all want to give their children the best possible uh, start in life. And if they came together, um, understanding their collective identity and their collective power, um, they could really push forward changes that all families want. Um, I'm in the midst of, I have a new book coming out, uh, Parent Nation, and I talk to families from all different backgrounds, from 
all socioeconomic statuses, from educational backgrounds, um, from the left, from the right, and ultimately all parents wanted the same things for their children and desired and, the same sort of societal support. Sorry. And, and no, it's okay. And of course, uh, you mentioned that book, Parent Nation, coming out in April. We look forward to having you back on uh, to discuss that later on, but that's where we'll have to leave it for now because obviously you and I can talk about parenting all day. Dr. Dana Suskin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Up next, a legendary Chicago musician makes a comeback after hitting rock bottom. We share his story right after this. I come from a people that not only found a way to survive through the most horrific circumstances, but they thrived. I could not save one of the boys of color in my own life. If my family could be exposed to this horror, then really it could happen to anyone. We are truly all in this together. There are many ways the COVID-19 pandemic has turned lives upside down. This next story is about the emotional devastation and recovery experienced by one beloved local musician. Jay Shevsky brought us this story last year and here's another look. Back in early March 2020, just before COVID shut the world down, a group of musicians recorded the 16th CD of a legendary Chicago pianist. But they had no idea the 84-year-old musician's life was about to fall apart. Okay. And that within two ready? months, he would be in a hospital psych unit. My name is Erwin Helfer. I play a roots kind of piano, blues, boogie, and standards. Erwin Helfer is also quite modest. He's got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Chicago Jazz Institute, a Chicago street named in his honor. And he was among the first to bring blues musicians from the South Side to North Side clubs and white audiences. You, you want to sit on this note. Da, de, da. He fell in love with the music when he was just 16. Da, de, da. I was a teenager and I could drive, so I'd drive down to the south side. And my dad would take me to hear Little Brother Montgomery, or I'd go hear John, Blind John Davis on West Madison Street. Over the years, he became a trusted friend and fellow player to many blues musicians who came before him like Mama Yancey, the widow of pioneering boogie-woogie pianist Jimmy Yancey and a noted blues singer in her own right. America owes a great deal to these people. Nearly a year after that pre-COVID recording session, Erwin Helfer wants to talk about his trip to hell and how he got back. When the shutdown began, how were things for you then? They were all right for a while. Uh, but later on, it was not getting all right because I couldn't teach, which is what I love doing the most. I couldn't play, which I love doing. And I couldn't even walk into the bank. And I didn't know it, but I started going into a deep state of depression. Irwin says he became consumed by fear and delusions, like obsessively worrying that his house would burn down. What I was doing was, was accepting unreality for reality. Some people close to him were getting worried. One was the owner of Irwin's record label and a longtime friend. I was calling him every day, and just week after week, things seemed to be going in a bad direction. People were worried about him harming himself and not being able to take care of himself. So in early May, his friends intervened. They drove me to Rush Hospital where I stayed for six weeks. 
drug therapy he says didn't work. Group therapy was okay, but didn't bring back his will to live. Irwin and his friends credit his recovery to a treatment with a bad reputation, electroconvulsive therapy. ECT, or shock therapy as many call it, conjures terrible images. But doctors they trusted recommended it, and after nine treatments, Irwin and his friends could tell he was back. I knew I was getting much better when the nurse came up to me and she said, when was your last bowel movement? And I said, we just met, aren't you being personal? <laughs> and, and that's when I knew. <laughs> and when Irwin came home, he found that his friends had thoroughly cleaned his house and his good friend, blues singer Catherine Davis, had moved in to help. And now, about eight months later, he says the deep despair has not returned. And what he feels most is gratitude. The friends I have, what they've done for me, being able to get up in the morning and face a new day. The big difference in his life now, he's not playing music. No gigs, of course, but he doesn't even play at home. He says he's okay with that. Some speculate it could be a side effect of the ECT. Irwin doesn't think so. We interviewed Irwin in a room with a piano just in case, and he decided to give it a try. Some people have told me I was very brave for telling this story, and I don't think I was brave at all. I think I owed it to people. There are probably a lot of single older depressed people who are living by themselves and I just wanted to say it's possible to do something about it for Chicago tonight this is Jay Shevsky He's still got it. It's good to see Irwin Helfer back. And the Old Town School of Folk Music is throwing Irwin Helfer an 86th birthday celebration concert this Saturday night. Tickets are sold online and proof of vaccination is required. Helfer also released a new book. It's called Blues Piano and How to Play It. You can find out more on our website. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, our Spotlight Politics team on President Biden's first year, political challenges, and legislative priorities. And the taste, travels, and tales to watch out for in the latest season of To Dine For with Kate Sullivan on PBS. But first, some more of today's top stories. Governor J.B. Pritzker says COVID hospitalizations in Illinois have peaked. At a news conference today, the governor touted data that he says shows promise that the Omicron wave is starting to wane. You don't know when a surge has reached its peak until you're on the other side of it. Today is our seventh day since we saw peak hospitalizations of 7,380 reported on January 13th. Since then, our single day number of COVID patients in the hospital has fallen by over 870 patients. And Pritzker says the overwhelming number of people hospitalized were unvaccinated, but says the drop in hospitalizations are, quote, a hopeful sign that vaccinations, boosters, and masks are working. Family members of 49-year-old Tamiko Talbert, who was shot and killed last Friday on her way to work, are joining with local politicians and activists to call for an end to the violence. They're calling for a comprehensive and community-led gun violence prevention plan. 17th Ward Alderman David Moore is asking anyone with information on Talbert's shooting to come forward. This is just not another body. Tamika was just not another person. She was a wife. She was a mother. Yeah. And she was a friend to many. And so whether we knew her or not, she's a part of our family. And so it's important that we just recognize that you don't put a statistic on Tamiko, you put a name on Tamiko. You put a name on it. And so if you've seen something out there, you must say something. Minnesota's Attorney General files a lawsuit against two Illinois companies operating COVID testing sites. Attorney General Keith Ellison says the Center for COVID Control and Doctors Clinical Laboratory defrauded Minnesotans by either failing to give test results or delivering fake
fake or inaccurate results. The Center for COVID Control is based out of suburban Rolling Meadows and has 300 locations nationally, including many here in Chicago. Some people reported receiving test results despite never having submitted a sample for testing. Meanwhile, the Better Business Bureau is warning against scams related to the federal government's website offering free COVID-19 test kits. That website went live today. Chicago Public Radio WBEZ is set to merge with the Chicago Sun-Times to become a new nonprofit company at the end of this month. The historic deal was unanimously approved late last evening by WBEZ's board of directors. And as part of the deal, the Sun-Times would join the new nonprofit as a subsidiary, but would have its own board. The merger is set to be completed on January 31st. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Thank you, Paris. And of course, don't go anywhere because uh, we're coming up to you next uh, as we bring in the rest of our Spotlight Politics team to talk about Chicago's violence, the latest from Washington, and much more. Joining us now are Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and of course, Paris Schutz. So, uh, Mayor Lightfoot is in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, where increased violence nationwide will undoubtedly be discussed. Here's what she said yesterday about getting more federal help. We also uh, need more resources from uh, the Marshal Service uh, to help us um, identify and find uh, fugitives, um, and particularly um, the tens of thousands of people who have outstanding warrants from, again, the Cook County Courts where nobody's looking for them. That can't be the full responsibility of the Chicago Police Department. Heather Sharon, does the mayor have a new strategy for fighting crime? Well, she has a four-month-old strategy for fighting crime. On Friday, she will present her so-called Victims Justice Ordinance to the City Council's Public Safety Committee for a hearing. That ordinance would give the city the ability to sue gang members to attempt to recover their ill-gotten gains or profits that they have earned from their illegal activities. It is going to be a hard um, push to convince them because that measure as I said, is four months old. It hasn't gone anywhere, and it faces just a buzzsaw of opposition from civil rights lawyers, as well as uh, violence reduction advocates, including some of whom are very have been very close to the mayor. So she has got to convince the city council that this is the way to approach this issue, and we will have to see whether the concern about crime um, frees up this ordinance from the limbo that it's been in. Paris last night was a remarkably violent one, and according to one report, uh, some Chicago police brass are losing confidence in police superintendent David Brown. Does the mayor still have confidence in him? Yeah, but this was a Sun Times story, basically quoting some commanders saying commanders do not have confidence in David Brown, but I don't see anything to suggest that Mayor Lightfoot has lost confidence in him. She's appeared in recent press conferences with him, and she has a lot riding on this. Obviously, the homicide rate was abysmal last year. It hasn't started off very good this year, but this was her big pick. And if she fires him or if he comes to resign now, a year before she goes into an election season, it almost feels like a tacit admission of failure uh, on the violence front. So she stands to lose a lot politically if she does fire him right now. Her political fortunes are tied to him because, again, this, this is the big agency that the mayor has control of, the Chicago Police Department, at least for now. And this was her pick, David Brown, out of Texas. And, of course, policing is something that she ran on, something that she had credibility in at when she was campaigning uh, for mayor. Amanda, she also poked at Chief Judge Tim Evans again in that press conference over violent offenders being released on electronic monitoring. They have been at loggerheads on this, we know. Um, is there a compromise or some way for the two of them to come to an understanding? I'm not sure what that compromise would be. The mayor has called for more individuals to be kept behind bars if they are accused of mostly violent crimes, but also weapons charges, even if that weapon was not actually discharged or used for a violent act. The chief judge saying that that does not meet constitutional scrutiny, that you are innocent until proven guilty, and that her policy would lead to too many innocent individuals being kept behind bars, that you need to kind of go to the, the, the denominator where if they are going to return to court, you need to keep in the public safe, but you cannot just put, lock everybody up while they are awaiting trial. So. Um, 
maybe there would be some sort of compromise. I think the issue here is that we've gotten partial letters released to the public. What we have talked about before, what I think members of the public talk about is that you really need to have here some sort of um, consensus, a relationship, coordination between the chief judge's office, between the state's attorney, between the mayor, between the CPD. Instead, it seems as if they are uh, loggerheads over both the policy and probably uh, you've got to figure some of their political futures way into this and it is just not getting done. Heather, is this whole argument, is it failing to, to get any traction with voters, members of the public? Well, it's really complicated, and there have been so many figures and, um, you know, this person did this, and then they were released for this amount of money. It's really hard to sort of parse sort of exactly who's telling the truth. And the, the Chicago Tribune did an in-depth analysis of the mayor's rhetoric on this issue, and they found that she has presented um, misleading, if not outright false information about the people who have been released on electronic monitoring after being charged with murder or attempted murder. So I think that's part of the problem too. People aren't sure sort of what actually is happening. And if you ask the chief judge, he says, look, there's there's no evidence to show that this is driving the violence in Chicago. The mayor disagrees and that's where that dispute comes. It's a zero sum game. You can't sort of say, well, maybe it's like, we'll find a middle ground here. And it's really hard for members of the public to figure out what's happening when you can't even agree on the facts in question. And that's problem. So let's jump into some national politics here. President Biden held a rare uh, press conference as his signature Build Back Better bill floundering and the voting rights bills dead without a change to the filibuster. Here's what he said about Republican leader Mitch McConnell's opposition. I get on with Mitch. I actually like Mitch McConnell. We like one another, but he has one straightforward objective. Make sure that there's nothing I do that makes me look good in the, in the mind, in his mind, with the public at large. Now, Paris, for the first time, President Biden said that Build Back Better should be broken up into uh, parts in order to pass um, as soon as possible. What do we know about what are the priorities? Well, it's hard to know what parts of Build Back Better would be able to pass because it would appear to uh, uh, overcome any kind of filibuster. You need to have 10 votes to end the debate, to enforce cloture. And as the president said, you know, he, may, he asked the question, what do Republicans stand for? What are they for? It certainly doesn't seem like they're for any part of this bill. I mean, things in this bill that have gotten bipartisan support in the past would seem to be extending the child care tax credit. That is a priority in this bill and of Democrats. It's something that Senator Mitt Romney has said he's supported in the past, but it certainly doesn't seem like any Republicans are, are going to put their name on supporting any aspect of this bill right now. And it also doesn't seem like Senators Manchin and Sinema want to move to change anything about the filibuster. Obviously, they're having that debate right now as, as it relates to voting rights. And Amanda, with inflation up, Omicron raging, the Democrats at odds, the GOP blocking Biden's priorities, president polling at a 40 percent approval rating. Give us a quick sense of what the midterms are looking like. Brennis, I think you answered it a bit right there in your question. There is a lot of turmoil in the nation. I think there are a lot of voters who are upscared, they're set, they're over COVID, but yet they can't be. Bills are stacking up due to inflation, supply chain issues. So it certainly is a very difficult midterm. And we already know going in, typically midterm elections are difficult for the party that has a sitting president. So um, it, it is going to be a, a a tough one, I think, for Democrats particularly as they look to hold any sort of control in Washington, that small margins that they have right now, not enough, as Paris just mentioned, to get their policies enacted. So it's certainly and, going to be difficult for that party. And as Amanda reported uh, tonight, the Illinois Supreme Court is weighing whether elected officials can use campaign funds uh, to pay for their own legal defense. Um, Amanda, you know, the, the Illinois State Board of Elections voted eight to zero that politicians could, in fact, use their war chest for legal defense. Does this have a snowball's chance of being reversed by the Supreme Court? 
You know, I don't like to presume at all what the justices will do. And, of course, the State Board of Elections is an entirely different body. One that you had the attorney, uh, one, one of the attorneys say, you know, it is sort of different than most boards in that it is split evenly between Republicans and Democrats. By the way, the Illinois Supreme Court is not right there. And that it is a body that is created under the state constitution. So it has a little more authority, but it is a very different question that the State Board of Elections is facing than the Supreme Court does. And it's sort of interesting because one of the criticisms of the State Board of Elections is that they don't take proactive measures. Instead, they are really more a reactive body. You have to bring a question before it. So uh, I, I'm not going to presume where this will go, but certainly this is a practice that has long been used by so, politicians, and that makes me think that maybe the court's not going to overturn it. So let's move over to the race for Governor Paris. Aurora Mayor Richard Urban makes his bid official. First, tell us who he is. Aurora mayor, uh, obviously. And well, is he really a Republican, having voted for Democrats? Well, that's a very interesting question, and it was an interesting choice. He's got a very compelling personal history. We've interviewed him before. Grew, born and raised in Aurora, public housing, prosecutor, alderman, and now mayor. He has pulled Democratic ballots in several recent elections. He's taken positions like supporting sanctuary cities. He has said in the past he fervently supports Black Lives Matter, but then in his campaign role, he said all lives matter. And in certain contexts, that can be a very loaded phrase. Seems all but certain at this point that Griffin and they've announced an entire slate of ticket uh, of 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 candidates here for for office here is going to be the candidate of of Ken Griffin, the state's richest resident. Even though Griffin is saying, "Well, I haven't met him yet," but Griffin put out a statement saying he had such a compelling history and echoing a lot of the things that Irvin said. And you know, so much of political campaigns is optics. When I look at him and Avery Bourne and their pictures and stuff. I, I see the top five constituencies that they're going for here are suburban women, suburban women, suburban women, suburban women, <laughs> and suburban women, and, and almost to the point where I don't think they care if they get much of the more conservative vote south of I-80. I think they're going to hammer things like public safety and taxes and, and hope they get – it makes sense because, you know, this is a blue area, but – the most Republican voters in number is in the Chicago area, so that's the strategy that they're banking and, on here. And Heather, meanwhile, uh, billionaire Governor J.B. Pritzker has given uh, his own reelection bid $90 million, $90 million. Uh, and we're already seeing campaign commercials featuring uh, one of your Chicago Tonight anchors, whether we like it or not. Is campaign season getting earlier and earlier? So it's actually not. It seems to me like we just had an election. I'm still recovering. I'm exhausted. But they are out passing petitions, which means that the election itself is right around the river bend. So we are just in the thick of it. And it is going to be a hard fought, very expensive race. You will see all of the ads all of the time, especially if Ken Griffin does get behind the, the, the Republican ticket, as we expect. And it's going to be fought on a number of issues, COVID, taxes, pension, the future of Illinois. And we actually had Governor... And crime. And, and crime. crime. And absolutely. Crime. And we heard Governor Pritzker sort of take the first veiled shot at Irwin today, saying that he hopes that anybody who wants to be governor of Illinois will take questions from the news media about their plans. Of course, and of course nobody's had a chance to, to question the, the newly GOP-named uh, ticket. So we'll see. Obviously, we're all waiting on that. Uh, that's Spotlight Politics. Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Thanks, guys. Up next, a taste of the new season of To Dine For with Kate Sullivan. But first, a look at the weather. Crawfish on an island that has no residence, only a restaurant. Bar food in a New York City tavern, a classic steakhouse in Texas. This season of To Dine For with Kate Sullivan takes viewers on a journey with successful and sometimes prominent guests sharing stories over their favorite foods. Joining us now with more on the new season is Kate Sullivan, creator of the show. Kate, it is good to see you again. Brandis, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, and in the interest of, you know, full disclosure, uh, 
our friends at home. Kate and I are very good friends and have shared many a meal and conversation <laughs> as well. Um, we like so to eat. <laughs> we do love a good meal. Um, yes. So for those who don't know, give us a, a quick sense of the concept of To Dine For. Yeah, it's a very simple concept. I go with the guests to their favorite restaurant, wherever that is in the country or the world. We eat what they love. We see where it is that they love. So you get an idea of the restaurant, the ambiance. And then we let the restaurant be a backdrop for a conversation on what they created. Every guest on the show has created something out of their own imagination. And we hear how they did it, whether they are a CEO, a founder, an architect, or an artist. And you've got some of all of those folks in season four. Uh, last yeah. week in the first episode of this season, you spoke with Emmanuel Acho, author, NFL analyst. Uh, here's some of what he told you. I went to an affluent high school called St. Mark's, all boys private school. And at the school is predominantly white, but at home it's Nigerian culture. So I'm eating goat meat, I'm eating rice and stew, I'm eating pounded yam, I'm eating plantain, um, and, and listening to Nigerian music, going to Nigerian small groups. Mm. But then you go to school, and again, it's predominantly white. Right. And it's the Dallas Cowboys, and it's barbecue. And yes. It's, and it's, it's different. Texas. Yes. So I, I had to kind of be a master of fitting into different places, mm. which honestly has served me well, I guess, mm -hmm. in this day and age, because now I... I too have been able to kind of like a chameleon be able to blend in different spaces and different places. Mm -hmm. Now, Kate Acho is known for his, uh, his video series, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. What did you take away from your conversation with him? Well, first of all, food tells a story, and that's the very premise of To Dine For and why we're doing the show. Um, he was talking about eating uh, goat meat and rice and stew and plantains and his Nigerian background and his ability to be in all these different scenarios in life, whether it's a white high school or being in the NFL, predominantly black. Being able to be in so many different rooms in life led him to the moment of creating uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Um, I love his story because it really shows that um, it doesn't matter where you come from. It's what you learn where you are. And what, uh, what really signifies so much about Emmanuel's journey is the fact that he learned in every room he was in and brought it to creating uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Now, we all have to eat. Why is food such a, a good way to bring people together? You know, it's the great common denominator. Um, we, you're right, we, we all do have to eat, but very often what we like to eat in our favorite spot speaks to where we're from, our culture, where we came from, and, and what that says about us. You know, whether it's a simple cheeseburger um, somewhere in Chicago, or whether it's someplace a little bit more complex that speaks to you know how we grew up it really does tell a story and um i also find that a, the best conversations happen over meals you know whether it's at, at the dining room table with your family whether it's you and i brandis um having a great conversation over a meal it somehow what is said is always um, more intimate it is more real it's more authentic when it's over food that's right. We get a lot covered, you and I, Kate. Yes. Um, <laughs> you also spoke with famed architect uh, Jeannie Gang. Here's some of what she said. Um, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time just in the outdoors making a treehouse. Did you? <laughs> Things like that, So yes. you, were, you were creating and constructing buildings, treehouses, <laughs> when you were a child. Yeah, definitely create things. Even making houses out of, like, a pile of snow, you know, to have fun. My mom would boil some water on the stove and then I would take it out and carve holes into the snow pile <laughs> for, for a fort. Like make igloos, yeah. sort of? <laughs> and of course, Gang is uh, well known uh, here in Chicago as well as around the world, but specifically here for some buildings that she's designed in Chicago. Uh, which restaurant did she take you to and why that one? Yeah, she took me to the restaurant Brondi, which is famed chef Carrie Nahabedian's restaurant. Uh, uh, chef Nahabedian had Naha, which was also in River North, and Brondi is her newest venture. It is French, and it's elevated, but it's also very accessible, absolutely delicious food. But, you know, Jeannie is a force of nature, and she is a giant in the world of architecture. She's in our backyard. She's currently creating the tallest building in the world by a female architect, which is the St. Regis Vista Tower. Um, hearing the roots of her creativity and how she does what she does, absolutely fascinating story. And that's actually on WTTW this Sunday at 4 o'clock, the Chicago episode. Okay, so folks can catch that one this weekend. Now, Kate, you filmed, filmed this entire season, of course, during this pandemic, um, and we all know that restaurants have been struggling. What did you see about how they're maintaining? 
Yeah, I mean, it, the, the restaurants that are maintaining are having to pivot like they've never pivoted in their life. Um, it is a, the honor of my life to be able to go into these restaurants and to tell their stories too. So often um, when I talk about To Dine For, I talk about the guest journey, like you mentioned, Emmanuel Achao or Jeannie Gang. But really, this is a love letter to great restaurants around the country and the hard work of the hospitality industry. And um, never do I think, the, never has these stories been more important important than the past couple of years as we want to celebrate and raise a glass to great restaurants and the work that they're doing. Well, cheers to them and cheers to you. Yes. Always good to talk to you. Thanks for Thank you, Brandis. Really appreciate it. And to see when you can catch the new season of To Dine For with Kate Sullivan, visit our website, wttw.com slash schedule. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Omicron overwhelms a South Suburban Hospital and changes are coming to a local police department. Harvey, Illinois is the next stop on our In Your Neighborhood series. And puppets of all shapes and sizes come to life as we go behind the scenes at the Chicago International Puppet Festival. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.